Welcome to uh, watching commodity malware get sold to a targeted actor. Uh, you're in Lagoon K, and uh, the speaker before us this afternoon is Israel Barak. I, I would just a few housekeeping things. Um, right after this session, we, we have the welcome reception down in the business hall, so that's Bayside AB. Uh, the Black Hat Arsenal continues all day tomorrow, and that's in the Palm Foyer on level, level three. And then there's also the Pony Awards today in Mandalay Bay, BCD, and that's at uh, 6.30. So uh, I, I just just quickly would, would suggest also, if anybody's sitting at the back, you might want to come up. We've got a fair bit of space in this room, and Israel has some slides with some, some print that you might want to read that might be a little harder from back there. So I do encourage you to move forward. And uh, we remind you to put your phone on vibrate so that uh, we don't have to listen to that oh-so-cool ringtone. Without any further ado, welcome Israel. Hey guys, and good afternoon. It's uh, great to be here this evening. Uh, my name is Israel Barak. Um, my name kind of gives away my country of origin. Um, it's been a, it's been a, a nice uh, trip over to Vegas, and with this uh, nice uh, weather outside, it makes me feel right at home. Um, the topic that we're going to talk about today is when we see an incident and we try to classify it as targeted, untargeted, is it even a relevant question, right? When CISOs or SOC managers prioritize their issues based on whether there's an intent to create damage to the organizations, are they even making the right decision? And our claim here is that it's an irrelevant question, and we'll see exactly why. The demonstration or the, uh, some, some of the research that we're, we're going to go through here actually goes through black market trafficking of compromised enterprise resources. And we'll talk about how uh, threat actors actually exchange ownership over owned and compromised enterprise resources, transferring something that may start it as an adware or a click fraud campaign into something that's extremely targeted, which could happen in a matter of hours or a couple of days. And we'll see exactly how they do that and the platforms that they use to do that, which are, by the way, I encourage you to use those platforms and go kind of into them. Uh, we're going to show one of them publicly available. I think it's a very tool to know uh, extremely well. So first things first, right, we'll talk about the platform that powers this transition from untargeted to targeted or the trading of compromised enterprise resources. We'll see the exact mechanism through which buyers, sellers, marketplaces transact and transfer ownership of machines. We'll look at the practices. It will help us understand towards the end how can we detect these processes are happening inside our networks on assets and incidents that we've previously deprioritized as maybe a low threat risk or a low risk threat. Um, we'll uh, take a look at a specific case study of how this transition from seller to buyer looks like from the attacked organization's perspective. So when you monitor your asset, what you would typically see when this transaction is taking place. A few words about myself. Um, name is uh, Israel. I started my career in the um, Israeli Defense Forces. I headed the Israeli Defense Forces Red Team, moved on to uh, a cybersecurity uh, consulting group and founding that group, uh, which later we uh, merged into Citigroup. That kind of gave me an interesting perspective, not only on nation state level threats, but also into uh, cybercrime related activities and cybercrime related groups. And I'm uh, currently the CISO at Cyber Reason. So let's say, let's understand the state of mind here and the, the drivers of a click fraud oriented cybercrime organization to start selling machines in the black market. And you can see here the, uh, the exact rationale, right? If what you would do is uh, use a machine, a compromised machine, to run a click fraud campaign, then average, averagely speaking, over the lifetime of a machine, 
you would generate between 20, 10 and $20 on each compromised machine that you own. If you're doing bulk sale, as in selling groups of machines for operations like DDoS or spam, you're likely to make between $18 and $36 across the lifetime of a compromised machine. And if you do the extra mile and check the compromised machines that you own to see how much they can be worth in the black market as individual sales, especially when they're affiliated with specific corporates, then you're looking at an average lifetime value of a machine, a compromised machine that ranges between ten and thousand dollars. Some, let's say, unique assets can go upwards towards even the the, uh, the eight thousand uh, dollars per machine. So that drives the interest of groups that traditionally focus on mass compromise for click fraud or adware campaigns. Uh, that drives their interest in individual sales. If you look at the, uh, the un unwritten valuation model of how would you evaluate a compromised asset when you put it up for sale on, on a black market platform, typically uh, a basic pricing of 5 to $10 would be upped by around 50% if you gain some technical advantages like admin privileges, a machine having a publicly accessible IP, or a very high network bandwidth. You'll start upping the price a lot higher if you're talking about a machine that has interesting software running on it, like a point of sale software, or a machine that has accessed in the past interesting web assets, like financial portals, online gaming portals, so the purchaser can expect to find interesting credentials in. And you'd really hit the jackpot if you find machines or you compromise machines that have strong affiliation with interesting corporations. That way, you can save the attacker, especially the targeted attacker, a large amount of effort when it comes to gaining access into certain user networks or subnets or even the data center inside its target organization. And we'll see exactly how easy it is for the seller those sellers are going to be like kids in a candy store, and we'll see that in a moment. We'll see exactly how easy it is for them to click, see exactly where that machine is, click buy, and they own an RDP and a direct RDP into that data center or into that user segment. How many of you have uh, used the platform or went into the platform or heard about the platform called Xdetic? Cool. So I encourage every one of you to give it a try, right? Xdetic is one of the most prominent actors in the uh, black market for compromised resources. They're just one of many, but they're really leading the innovation and the commoditization of this market. You can see that there's, it's not a tour domain there. It's called xdetic.biz. Anyone can go in there. Um, I think it's an important asset for every security professional to understand exactly how these marketplaces work. Let's uh, look at a few characteristics of these marketplaces that would help us understand what are their limitations so we can better understand how to hunt for the existence of these processes in our networks. So a little bit about code of conduct, right? So important. We're only a marketplace to buy, sell RDPs, right? RDPs is, and, and the spelling errors in, <laughs> are in, uh, in, the or, in the original here. You can actually hear the, uh, or, or imagine hearing the, the heavy Russian accent behind the, uh, this text, right? RDPs is uploaded by suppliers, and we don't know where they, got, they get them, Right? There's an interesting interpretation of the legal reality and, on, and what you need to do or, or represent to not be perceived as an accomplice. Right? Let's look at something that's, uh, that's extremely interesting and actually crucial to the successful operation of a marketplace. We don't sell dead or not working RDPs. What that means is that a marketplace would not transact a sale if it's not able to connect to that compromised asset 
prior to the transaction because they know that the, if they're not going to do that, they're going to they're get a ton of outreaches from buyers saying that they cannot connect, they want their money back. That way they can say, we've connected. If you, Mr. Buyer, can't, it's your problem. We keep the money. And that's going to be very significant when we talk about how we detect the setup of a command and control channel for these guys to detect these guys. So RDP is extremely, extremely uh, uh, common. SSH can be seen as well. But it's going to have to be a solid, reliable, continuous, automatically verifiable command and control channel. And this is what you buy as a buyer. You buy an IP, you buy a port number, you buy a username, and you buy a password. This is how we can expect to see our buyers connecting into those compromised machines being sold on these, uh, on, on these marketplaces. Let's look at a few examples. This is how the UI looks. It's going to be very, it's going to feel very, uh, very familiar, especially to, uh, you know, to guys that buy machines on Rackspace, on AWS. It's the exact same model. You filter based on where you want to buy, what you want to buy. You look at the offering and you click buy. And that's all there is to it. And it's added to your list. Here's an example. I filtered here based on machines in the United States. Um, I looked at it uh, two days ago. It had about 15,000 machines for sale in the United States, about 40,000 machines worldwide. Thousands of machines are added every day. Thousands of machines are taken out every day. An interesting machine would get out of that forum within two to three hours. So here's, uh, here's an example. We have here a machine in, uh, in Washington, uh, Seattle, a Windows 10 machine offered by a reseller, admin privileges, direct IP access. Who is it? University of Washington. That's great. Three bucks. It's going to be, if you look at the, uh, at the bottom there, it has a point of sale software installed on it. So if you want to potentially go into uh, an IP theft, operation from the University of Washington. You want to get some credit cards on the way. That may be the right asset for you. Another asset, Phoenix, Arizona. Who's that? EC Suite. Haven't heard about those guys before, but they're being sold. A server there in their data center is being sold for $14. If you look at their website, they're a credit card processing operation. So I may not have heard about them in the past, but if what I'm looking for is compromised credit cards and personal information, guess what? They just now hit my target list. Those guys, maybe a medium-sized business, they kind of, their security state of mind is, who's going to target me, right? No one even knows about me. But guess what? When you get compromised, even by a simple adware, you're on that list. And once you're on that list, you're on these guys' target list. Bristol, Virginia, a, uh, a server in the data center of Microsoft Informatica. If you're interested in, uh, in uh, intellectual property, that's a good place to look for it, right? Maybe someone would be able to buy whatever intellectual property that Informatica has to sell, right? If you go to Ecstatic right now, it's, maybe it's still there for sale. If it's not, I'm sure you can find out some other stuff. Oregon Hillsboro, Intel Corporation, 13 bucks, a server in their data center. Not bad. Not bad if you want to start with uh, a data breach and you don't want to go, go through the uh, phishing process or malicious attachment, lateral movement in their network, risk of being detected. You can just get a direct pipe into their data center, 13 bucks. And it goes on and on. University of South Florida, University of Pennsylvania. Who's this guy? Washington, D.C. A seller, interesting name this seller has chosen for, it, for himself. Uh, selling a machine for 850 bucks. That's a pretty expensive machine. That's a pretty expensive machine. It's being serviced by Comcast Business Communications. Interesting. The next uh, DNC hack, or is it the Trump side? Good question. Maybe a machine worth buying. 
just as a anecdote, in terms of the states that are leading the list in terms of the number of compromised systems on a per state basis on those compromised machine marketplaces. I can, I'm going to give you the first four. I'm going to ask you to guess the fifth. California opens that list with 25% of compromised computing uh, resources. New Jersey, 11%. New York is six. Texas is six. Who would you say is number five? Sorry? Okay. Not, not really. Keep going. Nope. Iowa, 6%, the same percentage as Texas. Go figure. But it is what it is. So now that we have a better understanding of how these marketplaces work, how they affect the targeting process of extremely targeted players, right, and how easy it is to transact on them and the vast amount of compromised resources that we see there that flow from completely untargeted actors, right, from adware, from click fraud, they all propagate resources into these marketplaces just because they raise their revenues that way. Now let's take a look and how this, at how this process looks from the attacked organization perspective. And this is a case study that we've done on a number of enterprises that we've seen this process taking place in based on a specific type of threat actor and a specific type of click fraud tool that they used in this case. So in this case, the incident started with completely untargeted, broad spectrum, uh, a known fileless click fraud tool, right? Um, just like you'd probably see every day of the week in your, uh, in your corporates and enterprises. It affected several machines. Um, it was, we de specifically detected it through the malicious use of PowerShell that it was doing, but in, in the uh, connection to a known malicious uh, IP address, as its command and control channel. But regardless, and very expectedly, it was deprioritized by the SOC as eh, commodity malware, damage potential probably extremely low, definitely not something to be addressed right now. Definitely something that can wait for a week or a month, or maybe we'd never get to it. But those guys actually continued to monitor the endpoints that were found uh, running this piece, of, uh, this piece of malware, and they also blocked the access. That was easy to do. So they blocked the access to the known IP of the command control. But what we saw is that five days after the infection, and that is, by the way, I think, an astounding data, uh, piece of data, it only took the attacker five days to understand that they've hit something interesting. And given the fact that these type of organizations typically manage, quote-unquote, millions of endpoints. The fact that it only takes them five days on average to figure out that they've hit something interesting, I think is extremely interesting from an IT management perspective. It testifies to a level of operation, of IT operation that these guys have. So one machine, they've started changing. One machine stopped attempting to communicate with its known C2, right? The idea is first... If you decided that something's interesting, you first want to make sure that you maintain connectivity to it. If you want to transact on it, you don't want to lose your connectivity to the asset. So they changed their C2 channel from using a known bad IP and a malicious known bad domain to using a DGA-based algorithm to generate their C2 IP address. And once they've done that, they've established communication with a previously unknown uh, command and control infrastructure. Once they've uh, done that, they've also changed the timing of when they generate command and control traffic. And that indicates uh, manual intervention into the, in, in this process. What they've seen is, apparently they've seen that the organization had blocked access to their known command and control channel. And what they've done is, they've stopped communicating with the command and control channel, even after the upgrade to the DGA, as long as those machines had a local IP that was part of the enterprise subnet. And only when those machines moved to an external, what they believed were external IPs that were 
192, 168, and 10-0, only then they would create a C2, uh, C2 communication. That kind of gives us uh, a better understanding of how much these guys value these assets. They would send in manual intervention and manual inspection of those machines to make sure that they don't lose connectivity and they don't get blocked. Once they've had this upgraded command and control channel, they've uh, started downloading and uploading much more information. Instead of the regular profile of a click fraud, which is a regular web traffic with, uh, uh, characteristic, with sizes uh, that characterize it, you know, pretty much we can, we can see those here. They move to uploading and downloading a lot more information, right? Probably testifying for downloading specific tools, uh, for uploading additional system information, et cetera, et cetera. Once they've had that, they've been, uh, the attack tool, right, the, the previously perceived uh, adware or click fraud tool started injecting code and migrating itself into a different built-in system process. In this case, it was MSDTC. And once they've migrated, that additional process generated the communication with a previously established uh, command control channel. Um, again, another technique to disguise their, uh, their operation on the machine and to gain a platform for hash dumps, privilege escalation, et cetera, et cetera. So given what we've seen during this research, based all on the analysis of these marketplaces and the nature of the transactions that they carry, as well as what we've seen in the case studies of the live incidents that we've seen in, in these enterprises, we can establish a set of, we can call them hunting rules, right? Or rules of thumb of what you would do or could do to detect these type of behaviors happening in your network. Right? Obviously, you're not going to highly prioritize any click fraud tool that you'd find in your network. But the question is, and that's the real question, how do you make sure that you keep your visibility into these endpoints that were compromised and were deprioritized and have the tools to understand that they're now going through a process that may cause you to reprioritize them for remediation? So for the C2 channel, we now understand that in order to transact on marketplaces, you need a very reliable, continuous, and auto-verifiable command and control channel. Typically, this would be an RDP-based channel. It's the easiest to transact based on. And so if you want to start hunting for it, the probable queries or the probable indicators that you would want to look for or the TTPs or behaviors that you would want to look for is, first of all, a change in the C2 behavior, right? We've seen this in the, in the case study, a change from a static IP and a static domain name into a DGA-based uh, C2 channel. Uh, connections to the RDP services. And I'm not necessarily talking about connections over port 3389. I'm talking about connections to the actual process that runs the RDP service, regardless of the port number on which it runs regardless of whether it's an incoming connection or something that started as an outgoing connection. Long-lasting connections. Obviously, if you want to transact, you want to make sure that the connection stays alive for the at least for the whole duration of the transaction process while it's being advertised for a transaction. Unfamiliar modules loaded or injected into the remote assistance services or the terminal services uh, service. Anything that can indicate an intent to leverage the RDP channel for covered communications. Privilege escalation is, is, an, is an obvious step for the seller. Why not up the sale price by additional 2 or $3 if you can easily escalate your privileges? So even if the original adware or click fraud tool didn't require system level privileges, you're going to be able to transact in a, you know, 10%, 20%, 30% higher price if you just take this step. So a machine that was compromised by um, a low, quote-unquote, low-risk threat that goes through a privilege escalation is definitely something that you want to take a look, check, take another look at. 
enumeration of processes, installed software, and web browser history, we saw that when you put an ad on, uh, that offers a machine for sale, you want to up its value for the buyers. The more information you put in there about an in installed software, like a point of sale or other, and websites or web applications that this machine had access to, the more value you're creating for your machine there. Uh, so hunting for unfamiliar processes, escalating privileges. Hunting for unfamiliar processes with newly created image files that are running in high privileges. Browser processes that are escalating privileges. Uh, DLL hosting processes that are running as local system they're loading unknown modules to identify persistence mechanisms like uh, uh, DLL side loading, and obviously enumeration of, uh, of browser history and installed software. With this, I'd like to ask you guys what were your thoughts on what you've seen and if there are any uh, questions that I may be able to answer. Right. So there is such a the uh, as, as, a, as a term, honor among thieves. And it works well in this community. The, uh, the idea is that it works a lot like a social network. Typically, a seller is not going to transact only once. And they have to maintain their reputation. If they screw a buyer, no one's going to buy anything from them again. If they overprice an asset, if a buyer, if a seller puts, uh, puts a machine for sale you know, with a price that is completely outrageous and against the code of conduct, and a buyer buys that thinking that there's a lot behind it and then figures out that there's nothing behind it, whether it was a mistake on the seller's side or not, the seller is not going to be able to sell anything to anyone again. So it's a matter of reputation. There's sort of this social network that these marketplaces are maintaining. So when you uh, register onto that site, you typically can, uh, can use Bitcoin or credit cards. The interesting thing is they run fraud check on you, fraud check on you. Because they don't want you, they don't want you to, <laughs> to get your money back. You know, they want to they be paid for what they're doing. So they would run the exact type of fraud checks on your credit card and on, on your IP, Right, the the exact same checks that you would expect to see with large e-commerce applications. So if you try to buy, if you try to connect through anonymous proxies, right, they're going to kick you out. <laughs> so, you know, you got to pay. It's it's a paid service. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions? Absolutely, absolutely. About 60% of the machines that you would find here don't have public IP, right? Endpoints, servers that don't have routable IP, right, or public IP, right? They're, they're sold all the time. The way they're sold is uh, up to the seller, right? The seller has to maintain an infrastructure. They have to give you, at the end of the day, an IP, a port number, username, and password that you can connect to through RDP, and you, it'll get you to that machine. Right? The way you do it as a seller is your problem, but it has to work. Any other questions? Yep, sorry. Well, here's the thing. Here's the thing. Um, typically, interesting machines disappear from that forum within two to three hours, on average. Slightly less interesting machines, but still viable assets, 
disappear within 24 to 48 hours. Now, typically, the, the way to know that these machines were bought, or at least a good percentage of them, were bought by someone who is not a cert or just wanted to take them down is a resell event. Marketplaces like Xstatic allows you to resell used RDPs. And so obviously you pay a small commission of 80% to the marketplace, but it's better than not getting anything. And so when you see high percentages of resells, you know that these were actual buys of those machines and not take, uh, they were not taken down. One more thing that, okay, guys, I'm, uh, I'm being flagged here. Um, you know, I'd be happy to take any additional questions. I'm, uh, I'm right here. I, uh, we can continue these conversations over the cocktail later this evening or right here. I'd like to thank you for joining the session and uh, to wish you, uh, wish, uh, wish you uh, a successful conference. Thank you.